So this is a part of uh, the conference's uh, side events program. And for the past two days, people have gathered at Slack to set to, um, to mingle and to hang out and to, uh, to also listen to some speakers. And one of the speakers that has been presenting at the conference uh, is Georgi. Um, and uh, in a couple of days, you will be able to, to, to also listen to that talk online on YouTube and on a video archive. Uh, but uh, today she's here, which is of course even better. Uh, and when Jerry's not here, she works with, she's the City Transitions lead, co-lead at Dark Matter Labs. You're also based in, in Copenhagen and we're very thankful for you being here as well. Please give a warm hand. Thank you. Thanks, I will use a microphone because I don't like things on my head. So. <laughs> um, so hi everyone, I'm Georgi and uh, I've been here for the last uh, three days. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Martin. <laughs> um, and I don't know much about professional neighborhoods, but I will talk a bit about some of the hidden walls we might create as re referring to your question and how uh, we might build more inviting uh, neighborhoods and perhaps some of the findings um, you might find useful. Um, I brought a lot of uh, global examples uh, from different cities, but first I just rushed through some more abstract conceptual modeling of um, why we should question behavioral change and how we sustain change. And then I'll go into some of very practical examples of governance innovation and, and inspir inspiring examples of cities. So we looked at civic participation, and I think when you try to open up your neighborhoods and make it more uh, vibrant, uh, it's very important how you engage uh, and create participatory approaches so more and more people can participate and not just, um, I guess, these uh, often one of more extractive engagement methods where we ask people of what they need and then we never follow up or they actually don't feel that there is any meaningful change in their, in their quality of life. Um, so we studied uh, one of my colleagues, Ryan Balinson, of different participatory approaches that are uh, very uh, common in across different cities around the world. Uh, more or less eight to ten of them, but four of them support meaningful de deliberation rather than high-level discussion. And I can talk later about the difference. And we also gathered, and I'm happy to share my slides, of different case studies of how you do citizen assemblies, appreciative inquiry, design charrettes, and of course, as uh, uh, Josh Lerner calls it, we need an ecosystem uh, of different practices to make sure that we involve people in many different ways. But what we found is, as I mentioned before, that this is often makes people, even with the best in intention, even more disempowered because they don't actually feel how their needs or the things that they mentioned was acted upon or what's changed in their lives. So we found that actually pairing these changes with governance innovation is very, very key. So how do you make sure that these people actually involved in the long run and key stakeholder groups, whether local businesses, communities and whatnot. So what we mean by governance frameworks or innovation is first the how, so that's focus on the decision making process that we create and who we involve. And then again, the who is about identifying where the power lies and who makes those decisions, who is accountable, who's paying for it and so on. Um, but even then, when we have good governance innovation, behavioral change still is not sustained. So we also need institutional change, infrastructural change, structural change. So a great example for this is if you're interested in or believe in sustainability and uh, different behaviors. For instance, you want to start gathering your food waste. If no one collects your compost, for instance, and you don't have a garden and there is no infrastructure for you to be able to change your behavior, behavior, you won't be able to sustain it. The same way with cycling in many cities, we know that we need to create dedicated cycle lanes, safer intersections and whatnot. Um, and then what we argue for through our research is that individual behavioral change, yes, it's a means, but actually is more an outcome of all these different par parallel interventions. So you can, for instance, provide a cycle lane for people, but if you don't reduce the appeal of car in parallel or provide good public transport, people will not uh, likely not start cycling. And obviously in, in this city, this is very common cycling. 
and I will not go into this um, at the moment, like gamification, it can be helpful sometimes for teaching and ed educative pr purposes, but often it doesn't lead to sustained change. Similar, for instance, let's pay people to be good citizens, let's create a token tokens or this very um, instrumentalist approach to <laughs> behavioral change, almost like infantilizing of, oh, I give you a token and then you'll behave better. So how do we move beyond uh, and question the idea of a proactive citizenship and how we part of a complex political and environmental uh, change? And I will again whiz through this. One more important thing in this research is social norms. So we often talk about individual behavioral change, but actually people are relational beings. So people behave as we think we ought to behave in the eyes of other people. So the social psychological aspects of our behavior is, is really key and how we create our mindsets and shape our worldviews through other people, both the first place, our family, friends, second space, work, uh, work colleagues and peers, and the third space, which is social media, and before it was libraries, community spaces that are very key, how we shape our mindsets about the world and what we consider, for instance, sustainable. And again, culture, so we see a lot of elections, for instance, uh, decided on TikTok in terms of young people. So we really need to understand how uh, policy often follows culture and the importance of that, but also our strategic communication. So whenever you do any intervention that works and you do the change, or even when it fails, actually, even more importantly, you not only do the change and make the change, but you also talk about you are making the change. So it's really important that you communicate um, through um, whatever communication strategy you have. And now I'm going to all the practical examples. My hands are always shaking. That was the same two days ago. <laughs> this is a beautiful example. So this is on air pollution. This is a historically red line, red lined um, region with the most vulnerable communities suffering from really severe air pollution from highways, trucks to the uh, ports and what they've done, they actually created uh, is, as a two-phase uh, two approach, a steering committee, uh, which was from truckers, school teachers, parents, health practitioners, highways authorities. They created this steering group who designed 89 different interventions across different neighborhoods of how to improve air pollution together based on uh, just transition principles. And as you can see, uh, they had a very holistic strategy from land use to uh, mobile source emissions to health programs and communication and so on. So they, this is a very fascinating example and also looking at who's the authority who's responsible and also the financing element of it. So how do we start setting up these governance frameworks for the long run, involve the communities you want to invite into this neighborhood and provide them opportunities. Participatory budgeting with all these critiques of whether it's tokenistic or not, obviously depending on how, how do you design these projects and whether it's just you give a few thousand and then people can decide, oh, let's plant a, a plot here in a, a parking uh, lot or whatever. That's not really the participatory budgeting that is needed, but actually how do you uh, co-develop and, and uh, co-produce uh, our future together? So my first question is for you, how can you develop a governance framework that enables your key stakeholder groups beyond this neighborhood? to co-produce the desired change that you would like to enable in Malmö, or the opportunity of provide, providing employment. So this is Greater Manchester, again, a brilliant example. They actually uh, have a large-scale retrofit program. They are upskilling 80,000 workers, looking at unemployment rates, especially with younger populations, super important. Um, create 10,000 new specialized construction jobs, which are high, higher paid jobs. Um, and creating a whole market for retrofit we get with again some new governance frameworks with the critical stakeholders, a retrofit accelerator and vocational training. So how might your neighborhood become a hub for future employment and a beacon of hope across Malmö for exciting, meaningful opportunities, especially in the green transition? So even if we set all our targets, we do not have a skilled workforce to deliver any of our, on our uh, any of our targets. You could maybe use this opportunity to develop a future scale strategy and understanding how you involve young people and different communities uh, across Malmö to come here for work and meaningful opportunities. 
And this is one of the very beautiful examples from Freetown, the tree town. So they, instead of talking about core benefits, they had massive problems with mudslides and heavy rainfall due to um, many different issues, including climate. And they created, um, they realized they wanted to grow trees. So they created this campaign where they found local growers who actually take care of the trees and they created through a really meaningful uh, private sector engagement and through their CSR strategy, a token to actually pay the growers. And as they take a photo uh, through develop this technology, take a photo of how they grow the trees, they get actually payment through this private sector token and they reinvest into their own neighborhoods with schools and local economic growth. Uh, but this is a beautiful example of how you can actually um, find uh, synergies in different key objectives and, and enable change uh, to bring to support the most vulnerable communities. This is another example from Camden, where they're building a community wealth fund to support the, the delivery of the, their key four missions, including one around young people and leadership, diversifying leadership positions, as well as climate change action. Climate action. <laughs> or, for instance, how they, um, the local authority uh, thinks, uh, thinks through uh, outcomes-led procurement and rearrange around those outcomes. So how can you create a multitude of impact pathways, which is not only about climate transition, but employment, engaging with young people. There are many incredible examples around the world of how great ideas young people have and how you could engage them in planning processes or just transitions. Also, we often develop outputs rather than outcomes, or as we call it sometimes with many of the programs, uh, we meet the targets but missing the point, as one of our colleagues usually say. So how do you actually start working with the community to create some of the combination of qualitative and quantitative indicators together, so not just economic value, but for instance, this is an old work from Yannick Baudin in the well-being economy. So this is a more qualitative cornerstone indicator. So this implies that in average 10 girls, to, uh, girls cycle to school daily. It, it means that uh, women and, and girls have educa access to education in the first place. They can afford to buy a bicycle. The crime rates are low enough in their neighborhood that their parents let them cycle on their own. And they, for instance, have a, a dedicated cycle lane, so it's safe enough to cycle. And as Enrica Panalosa said, I think uh, children are a really great, uh, great indicator species for health uh, of a city and a community. So we work with Vesteros, one of uh, a few of my colleagues, where uh, the community uh, co-designed these cornerstone indicators or of what the outcomes and the future they want for their community. So some of them are quite beautiful. The number of people who feel at peace on a Sunday night, the number of people who partake in an activity outside the household each week. So people who have, have to have two or three jobs to work every day, they will not be able to do any activities right outside of the household. Neither they feel peace on a Sunday night. Or, for instance, the number of people who enjoy not owning a car, which implies that there are indeed people who need to use a car. How do you bring about meaningful outcomes and impact? How do you account for social and environmental value? I think I'm very late, right? Tell me when. <laughs> so, one of the examples I gave two days ago uh, around, uh, for instance, social and environmental value is uh, we worked a lot with highways authorities and they often refer to drivers as people and they use pedestrians as non-motorized users and trees as fixed hazardous objects that needs to be removed from our roads. <laughs> so this gives you a really beautiful example of how some of the language and the words we use in our day-to-day -day life, in our policy papers, needs to be really thought through to understand how we uh, account for the social and environmental and economic value all together uh, in everything we do. This is another example from London, actually. So how we might increase the mobility options of people with diverse ethnicities, races, genders, religion. So this is cycling sister, cycle sisters of how you actually work with Muslim women who are otherwise not allowed to cycle due to different gender norms. So how do you understand these challenges? Or for instance, many black men, when they are cycled, they are st uh, stopped and searched by the police because they they're assumed that they steal their own bike. So understanding different challenges that people face on a day-to-day -day basis in our cities will be very key and with design uh, with that nuance in mind. 
landscape-led design, so I have no data on Malmö's climate conditions in, let's say, five, ten years' time, but we see that the data is, that's coming at us uh, is, is terrifying. Um, so, um, in London, for instance, in many developments we worked in, they focus less on architecture now and more landscape-led design, which is not landscaping, so it's not putting, um, I don't know, uh, uh, plant pots out, out uh, in development, but really looking at landscape-led design, biodiversity gain, green corridors, and, and so on. So this is just one of many examples. Uh, the Olympic Park, for instance, in London is a great has a great legacy of this. This is Medellin. They created these green, 30 green corridors, uh, planted 120,000 plants, uh, 12,000 trees. The, obviously, the maintenance of this is, is, is quite costly, so I, no one should underestimate it. That's why often good landscape after the planning permission is received is value engineered out on all developments. But especially when our cities will become 8 to 10 degrees hotter or even more, we will have summers in many cities from March to October each and every day. How do you make sure that you actually cool down your cities and start providing shade and, and these cooling effects? Um, and this one, I think, this article says it's cooled down the city 2 degrees, but I think there was another article that said 4 to 5 degrees. Um, gender-sensitive public spaces, and I only have a few slides left. Uh, so this is really important. So often we build, for instance, places for the same ages, but actually it's much better, or like from evidence at least, it showed that uh, younger girls, uh, they, ha they like to hang out with older teenager girls, for instance, rather than with the same age group boys. So how do you start understanding different needs or, for instance, Women often feel safer in public spaces when there is something behind their back, like the public furniture is designed that way. Or for instance, when you're in a gym, uh, this is Maya Ashkenazi's uh, research, how you create flow so when you don't feel safe as a woman, you don't actually have to exit, exit the space you are in by facing the person that you're not feeling safe. So how you create flow in a, in a way that people can actually uh, exit um, different spaces or even like when you cycle for instance in really thick vegetation or a bus stop which is behind uh, uh, in front of a like a really tall vegetation women often don't feel safe if someone is hiding in the bushes these are just very random examples but but important improving resilience and preparedness i will not talk much about this but this is a beautiful book heat wave uh, from the 1996 chicago heat wave it's a social autopsy of the public services and how they broke down in uh, during uh, this massive heat wave, but also understanding uh, there is a movement or a really important work coming from the US called Black Landscapes Matter. So how actually many of these examples really looked at a very meaningful way of engaging uh, and, and enabling social and environmental justice and racial justice and equity through these different actions, action plans, which I'm happy to, to um, share. And then programming the edges. That's just, uh, again, from um, Jane Jacobs um, and others, <laughs> of how if the edges don't work in a public space, uh, the, pub, the center of the space will not work. So how do you start thinking through the programming of the edges will be really key, whatever, um, however you want to create this more um, and live, livelier neighborhoods. Um, and that programming also, not only retail, not only food, but also free uh, public spaces, community centers, libraries, which you probably obviously have. But also how do you, um, I'm not sure if bleeding into the outside world is the right word, but how do you open up the ground floor that will massively change the way that the outside, the direct outside environment will be used or not. And so I saw that many buildings actually have quite a strong facade on the ground floor. So that might be something that you could think through to invite uh, the community into these spaces. And finally, which I mentioned before, how do you share these stories of change across Malmö so that uh, they know that they're all welcomed and invited into this neighborhood? Thank you. <laughs>